So hello everyone. Um, I would like to uh, talk about epigenetics today. And epi uh, from Greek means above. So um, at first I will say a few words about um, the book Epigenetic Revolution. Then I will talk a bit how um, epigenetic works at a molecular level and they'll uh, then review a few publications. So um, what I thought about this book, um, like the best thing that I could take from this book, but not from a textbook um, is uh, some historical context um, because in textbooks, you usually like, have stated mechanisms and no um, story, stories involving people behind. So this book not, not only talked about um, researchers, scientists who discovered those specific things, but also um, how we scientists look like, how we behave. It felt that the author was um, quite close to, to those scientists. So um, this um, book is an excellent scientific biography that charts the past, present, and optimistic future of epigenetics. And uh, I really liked the um, style of the book because it was vivid. It, it um, had a lot of um, comparisons and it was um, quite interesting to read it. Uh, for example, those comparisons were like, um, like how the author um, um, talked about methylation. So she said methylation is a bit like sticking a grape on a tennis ball. So like tennis ball is his stone and you stick a grape like that small methyl group. Uh, so it was quite funny that she thought of with such ideas. And, and, and these comparisons are um, quite um, uh, often um, mentioned, made in that book. Um, and do you want to guess um, what was written in the paragraph called DNA has a friend? What is a friend of the DNA? Do you want to guess? At first I couldn't thought of it, but it was histone actually. So this book is written in, in such an interesting way because I would never like call histone a friend of DNA, but like this book is really... Um, um, made so that when you read, you feel very close to that DNA, even, you know, you cannot see it with, uh, uh, without the microscope, but you feel like it's like a tennis ball. Then uh, in that book, you can find um, a lot of questions that are actually, like we uh, offer, um, ask the question and then says, well, it's quite an obvious, uh, obvious that um, we don't have um, uh, kidneys growing out of our um, our heads, our teeth, and our eyeballs. But why don't they? And then she uh, tries to answer that question. At first, she on, only raises those questions, and only in later chapters of the book answers them. And then she also, for example, says cells in our bone marrow keep on producing blood cells. Cells in our liver keep on producing liver cells. Why does this happen? And that's because cells differentiate. We become specialized uh, and arrange their genetic material. Uh, when the book started with three stories that um, at first seem very different. So it's that hunger winter when um, during, in the end of World War uh, II, people didn't have um, much food to eat. Uh, then uh, schizophrenia and why if one twin has schizophrenia, why another monozygotic twin has only 50% probability to have schizophrenia, not 100% uh, percent probability. And then a uh, first story is about neglected and abused uh, less than three years old children. And uh, why after that childhood trauma uh, in later life, we have um, increased risk of mental diseases. And again, she raises question, why sh uh, should something that happened early in life have effects on mental health that may still be obvious decades earlier, later? And 
then about the genetics. So this is the main thing I think. So I put it um, in in big letters. So it's uh, we are finally starting to unravel the missing link between nature and nurture. How our environment talks to us and alters us sometimes forever. Now this forever it raises the question: What can we do today? Maybe so if I was abused um, as a children. Um, what if I take drugs and make my um, epigenome um, without those marks that um, occurred during my childhood? Maybe that epigenetic um, markers can be changed and um, it doesn't mean that um, um, what happened in the past changed us forever. So, and then she says, if the DNA sequence, uh, sequence was all that mattered, identical twins would always be absolutely identical in every way. Uh, babies born to malnourished mothers would gain weight as easily as other babies who had a healthier style of life. Um, yeah, so about that uh, hunger story. So it was that uh, babies um, born um, to mothers that didn't uh, have enough food uh, for, uh, for them. Um, they, um, uh, their fetuses were uh, much um, smaller um, in weight. And um, this turned out to be that even these babies, when they um, had children, um, these children also had um, smaller weight. So it's definitely not DNA that um, made that um, affected that, but it's something on top of DNA, that epigenetics. So uh, about that twin story was that um, the other twin has a 70% chance of, uh, of developing schizophrenia if the twin is fraternal, meaning non-identical twin. Um, but if uh, the twin is monozygotic or identical, the risk jumps to nearly 50%. And um, so 50% and not 100% then should be because of twins' environment. And um, the study in 2005 um, actually examined monozygotic twins um, early in life and uh, didn't see much different in the levels of DNA methylation in those twins or histone acetylation, these are epigenetic marks. Uh, but after we looked into the same twins, uh, when they were much older, then there was a lot of variation with the, the pair of the amount of DNA methylation or histone acetylation. And um, this was especially seen when twins were not, um, were, um, were not in the same environment for a long time. So now a bit just the general overview of epigenetics. So we have 200 um, types of cells in our bodies and they all contain the same DNA, but uh, their uh, ph phenotypes are different because of those genetic marks on the DNA. And um, basically um, at first when um, again sperm, um, makes um, like fertilized egg when um, the cell uh, divides and produces similar looking cells. But after those tags are attached, then arises adult stem cells, which are, for example, liver stem cells who can, uh, which can divide only to uh, make liver cells. Because of those epigenetic marks, they cannot develop into muscle cells. So this occurs in time. Uh, so um, soon after fertilization, we have one cell, cell type, but um, later when cells divide, we start to get those epigenetic marks. And I would uh, not, in, in this video, um, very, very clear one, very easy one. Uh, there was that clock, but I would actually change it in a calendar because uh, those epigenetic changes um, doesn't occur in a few hours. They usually occur uh, occur in a few days. And the interesting thing, so as as we uh, already saw in that um, um, uh, famine story, uh, hunger story, that um, 
what our parents have experienced in their lives or what we have chosen are gonna affect us actually because of epigenetics. For example, if our uh, parents um, were smoking, then their DNA had those specific marks that are gonna be transmitted to um, fetuses. And then we see there, um, um, like application of epigenetics, uh, like that we know that food affects our DNA. So we may choose a uh, healthier food if we want to have um, like healthier marks on our DNA, or we should, um, we could uh, do more sports in order to make um, the environment of DNA healthier. Uh, and um, for example, if we use cocaine, then um, we get those epigenetic marks in our brains. And if we, when we eat uh, certain foods, uh, the um, cells lining the gut um, get epigenetic uh, modifications. And then microbiota, those good bacteria in our guts uh, produce fatty acids, like more or less fatty acids. And depending on that, we can get um, certain um, gastrointestinal diseases. Um, so the basis um, that uh, epigenetics is based on is um, that um, after differentiation, cells express specific proteins. So all 200 types of cells in our bodies have the same DNA. And, uh, but the thing is that not all DNA is transcribed to RNA and therefore not from all DNA, we um, have proteins in our cells. So epigenetics is one of the mechanisms a cell uses to control the amount of particular protein that is produced, especially controlling how many mRNA and protein are made from the original template. Uh, since epigenetic modifications don't change what the gene codes for, what do we do then? They actually control how much of the gene will be um, translated into protein. Um, epigenetics controls the level of the protein every cell expresses. Um, so here you see that DNA and you see um, enhancer, which is like before the gene and then activator protein binds when we have um, transcription of DNA and translation into the protein. Uh, so for example, we have a liver cell there and a brain cell there. So why liver cell produces certain proteins, but not the same proteins as brain cell produces? Well, simply because in the liver, we have regulatory transcription factors that are different from those transcription factors that are in the brain. And those transcription factors are also because um, they were transcribed from certain DNA that was active in liver cell, but um, inactive in the brain cell. Uh, now in, in the book, um, there was a lot of talk about Waddington's epigenetic landscape. So this is that fertilized egg that uh, can actually develop in any cell type. You know, it can, um, 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 it can make liver cells, it can make um, brain cells, it can make heart cells. And after uh, the ball uh, rolls, for example, in this groove, then it's liver cell. And it's very, very hard to make that liver cell to become a brain cell. Maybe it's sometimes um, easier to roll the ball up there and then from the liver cell, make it a heart cell. It's actually, it turned out to be easier than from there to there. So adult stem cells are found in, in differentiated tissues, for example, liver, eye, brain, and uh, the most studied one, adult stem cells are from bone marrow. Then embryonic stem cells um, are found in three germ layers of the embryo. So embryonic stem cells are pluripotent. So we actually this one, because it can develop, as I said, into liver cell, into cardiac cells, into um, um, nerve cells. 
and um, but it's not that tot totipotent because um, uh, totipotent means that it can develop in any cell. So it's uh, embryonic stem cells are pluripotent, and adult stem cells are multipotent. Means we can develop, uh, for example. Uh, nerve cells can develop only to certain kinds of nerve cells, but not to cardiac um, cells, cardiac myocytes. Uh, then adult stem cells seem to be more advantageous in therapy than embryonic stem cells because they uh, can develop into cancer cells. So uh, this is the part I really liked about the book. Uh, so with time scales, um, so first, it talked about um, transfer, uh, transferring the nucleus to an empty egg. Um, and um, this was done um, because the uh, scientists wanted to make the cell that, that is um, very roll up, uh, up downhill and then uh, to, to make it differentiate into another cell type. So this is, was done in one, um, 1952. Then John Gurdon, uh, uh, won of the Nobel Prize uh, 2012, um, 2012 um, winner, uh, he pushed nuclei all the way back up Weddington's landscape and uh, created new animals. And this was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. But others tried to repeat the same experiment, the one day older, um, toads. I think these were frogs, toads, yeah. Uh, and um, just when cells were one day older, no froglets developed, and this suggested that some irreversible inactivation of DNA had occurred. So then um, Campbell made first mammal mammalian clone sheep using a somatic cell nuclear transfer. And then in 2007, uh, uh, Shinya Yamanka um, made another very big discovery that uh, he found, like these techniques, somatic cell nuclear transfer is very time consuming and requires technical skill because imagine you need to take a nucleus from one cell and um, insert it into another cell that is without nucleus. And you can uh, have to do this for every cell separately. Whereas um, uh, this scientist uh, treated cells with pl four pluripotent genes and cell uh, cells uh, rolled um, up, back up Waddington's landscape and became, became less differentiated. So you do not, you can do this, uh, imagine you can take um, many plates of cells, just insert um, the medium that contains products of those four pluripotent genes, and the cells just became, uh, become uh, less differentiated. And we are called induced pluripotent cells just because um, those four genes um, induces them to roll up the Waddington's landscape. And in 2014, um, type 0 red blood cells were synthesized. So as you imagine, uh, the applications are very um, huge because um, you can um, take red blood cell from a patient and then roll, um, roll this up and then uh, more, um, and then just simply make more of those red blood, blood cells to be made and then you do not need donor for this patient. You just take um, a cell type. You can actually take any, you can take skin cell of that patient, then roll it up and then make red blood cells from that skin cell and then um, insert that red blood cells to the patient from which the skin cell was taken and uh, the patient should not get um, rejection. Um, if uh, you know that cell doesn't become cancerous, as we saw. Uh, so um, a bit about this guy. So actually, I think I said everything about it, about uh, what he did. Yeah. And um, then cloning of sheep. Yeah, so this is interesting. Um, so again, we removed um, 
a nuclei of the egg cell and they took a nuclei from another cell and then inserted the nuclei with electric shock and combined cell now had single nucleus from a nuclear donor and um, then it divided the cell um, there uh, were a bunch of cells that are called blastocyst and this was placed in the uterus of a surrogate Eve, um, like female sheep, and uh, this blastocyst developed into a fetus and in about five months a, um, a lamb was born, the dolly. So this just implicates that you can take a nucleus from any cell, like take nucleus from from my cell, insert it to um, an egg, and then um, um, a living organism will develop with um, the, the DNA that all my cells contain. And uh, the success rate is very low. Imagine uh, Dolly was the single success from 277 tries. So that somatic cell nuclear transfer is really, really inefficient. And what Yamaka did, um, it's really great. Um, because you can just insert those four pluripotent um, uh, gene products into the medium on cells and get in these pluripotent cells. Uh, then, um, so where else could be applied at the story of the dolly? Uh, we can clone horses. Uh, if we see that there is a winner horse, uh, maybe we could um, make more of them. Uh, we could take the cell from that winning uh, horse in um, take the nuclei of that cell, insert into the egg of a nucleated egg without a nuclei, it insert that winning horse uh, nuclei into the egg and get um, uh, clones of uh, winning horses. But the thing is that you need to have the same um, uterine conditions for that um, um, egg with inserted nuclei um, the same uterine conditions as a winning uh, racehorse had. So the, again, the chances are very low to clone exactly, exactly the same horse. Uh, then um, the future of those induced pluripotent cells it uh, is very promising. In these pictures, you can see that, as I said, you can take any cell of the patient and um, make it roll up to the Weddingstone's hill and then from uh, get induced pluripotent cells. Um, and then um, add other uh, factors, other proteins in the medium and make that cell to roll down to another groove to become, for example, neural cell. And then um, you can apply drugs on that neural cell, for example, drugs from Parkinson's disease and see if those uh, nerve cells uh, of that specific patient um, grows better or not. And this is kind of personalized medicine because you have a neuron of a specific patient that um, maybe has uh, mutations that are uh, individual to that patient, special to that patient and absent in another patient with the same Parkinson's disease. Mm, so another very um, good thing is that in this way, we could um, test drugs early on human cells. Um, and, uh, you know, like uh, earlier than, um, than now, because now we do first uh, test the drugs on animals um, and only then on humans. And then, yeah, so transfer land projection, I already said it. Uh, on regenerating tissues, um, exactly. So uh, we can, for example, make hepatocytes from induced pluripotent cells, make them uh, proliferate in the Petri dish, for example, and then um, uh, make, even if we um, um, divide it in Petri dish, um, I'm not sure if we would make the liver, but um, maybe we could insert, um, if the liver is dysfunctional, has uh, has the cells both died or after myocardial infarction at the outer of a road about it, cardiac cells 
are not like uh, liver cells. We, we do not have those adult stem cells. So if after myocardial infarction, some of your heart cells die, then um, we do not, uh, we do not redivide, we, we just dead. So if we would insert it, those cardiac cells, um, maybe we would uh, uh, divide and ma make the, the heart um, healthy again. Um, then induced pluripotent cells could also um, help us in understanding uh, how to make functional sperm or egg cells and this could benefit infertile couples. Um, then, uh, but the, a big drawback in this field is that we can develop an embryo from a skin cell. So as I told, so it's a bit, um, I don't know if it would be ethical if I took a biopsy from my skin and then make clones of me, um, like individuals, so as I am, um, so, but in that video, I showed you, uh, I showed you in this video, um, a short one. Um, so it was, uh, actually, um, said that there is no way back. We, we already know that we can make clones of people, but, and maybe somebody is doing this already, but you know, uh, we cannot prevent it. Um, no way back. And another drawback is that we cannot produce perfect, safe, induced polyripotent cells. So maybe we can make those hepatocytes, then um, insert them into a human. But what if they will become cancerous? Um, do we really don't have those mutations or epigenetics marks that are dangerous? So now a bit about molecular mechanisms um, that were talked in the book. In, uh, actually, all um, the simple examples that we have been taught uh, in lectures were mentioned by the author in the book. So I think it's quite um, relevant to mention them. So free mechanisms are DNA methylation, histone modifications, and known coding RNA. Um, DNA methylation is um, shown there, but also histones could be methylated, as you see those um, triangles and rhombuses. And also um, CPG islands um, on DNA are um, uh, methylated uh, specifically. So this is another time scale I really liked. And um, what I would keep in mind when um, uh, going through methylation is to ask yourself, is this methylation of DNA of it, or is this um, methylation of histone proteins? Acetylation is clear, it's yeah, of histone proteins, but DNA, so keep in mind. I think that in 1980s, um, people just had cells in their uh, petri dish, they added methylation, uh, like molecules with methyl groups, and we saw this transcription so we decided that methylation, um, uh, methylation is a genetic mark that uh, suppresses um, gene translation to protein. Uh, but I think that we didn't knew if this was um, DNA methylation or histone methylation. Then in um, um, in five years, Adrian Bird um, uh, saw that um, CPG. Uh, motives are in promoters and that uh, methylated DNA um, binds protein, uh, MESCP2, which we will talk about later. Uh, and then uh, David Alice uh, found acetylation. So uh, at this time, uh, the story was very simple, that when you have methyl groups on your DNA, you have no um, DNA transcription, the gene is inactive. And when um, DNA has acetyl group bound to it, then the gene is active. It was very simple. Sorry. Now we know a lot uh, more epigenetic marks like um, um, phosphate groups and ubiquitin groups, etc. In uh, 1999, Huda Zogby uh, found that mutations in that very relevant protein um, causes that protein to be non functional, and this leads to a red syndrome. So, red syndrome, I um, is um, a form of, of autism. So the scientists created mouse strain with the gene mutation and um, 
as you know, genes have two copies. So one copy was mutated and another copy of this gene was normal, um, but it was switched off. So it was um, methylated. And uh, you can reverse that methylation epigenetic mark. So um, um, these mice were grown so that we don't have that CP2 uh, um, protein. So imitating autism, uh, that red syndrome. But then uh, the mice were given harmless chemical uh, that reversed the methylation and so made that gene active. And um, those uh, mice became um, not uh, autistic. And this show that if we if we um, give that harmless chemical to autistic um, girls, red syndrome, uh, then uh, we could reverse autism probably. But it's not so simple, of course. But the idea is behind this. And um, in 2010, um, this gene mutation uh, was shown to um, lead to absence of methylation. Uh, of the DNA and Kabuki syndrome. So methylation um, occurs in promoters um, that have CPG islands and such promoters in humans made a large uh, percentage of promoters is 70%. Um, and um, this occurs um, that methylation occurs on cytosine um, that is near to guanine, those nucleotides. And uh, methyls then physically impede binding of transcription factors um, or methyl a CPG protein uh, 2, uh, the one we already talked about. Um, and thus, transcription of DNA does not occur. And all the proteins binding to methyl groups on DNA um, must have chromodomains. Um, and then those proteins of chromodomains after binding to methyl groups on DNA uh, recruit effector proteins. Uh, and um, when we talk about acetylation, um, proteins the bromodomains uh, bind to those acetyl groups on DNA. Um, and how do I remember this? Is that uh, chrom um, is more to the left in the chemical peri periodic table. It has lower atomic number and brom is um, more to the right. So methylation was discovered earlier than acetylation as you saw in the time scale. So means uh, chromodomain um, has to be related to the one epigenetic mark that was discovered earlier. So methyl groups are um, recognized by chromodomains and uh, um, acetyl groups are recognized by proteins that have bromodomains. And here you see histones that um, have methyl bound to it. Then uh, the DNA is very, very compact. It's called heterochromatin and transcription factors cannot bind and cannot transcribe uh, the genes. And if acetyl groups are bound to um, histones, then you see what happens with um, DNA, it becomes loose. And so you see those gaps here, proteins bind and, uh, and uh, transcribe your DNA into RNA and then to proteins. And acetyl groups are usually added on lysine amino acids, not uh, on all amino acids, only on certain ones. So that methyl CPG uh, binding protein and uh, those mutation causes autism, that specifically red syndrome. Mm, so that protein binds to 5-methylcytosine, a gene promoter, and, and attracts other proteins that also help uh, switch the gene off. And because girls develop severe mental retardation, uh, we know that this protein is most important in the brain. Uh, then Kabuki syndrome, I mentioned on time scale, if you remember, right here, um, 29, um, is a developmental disorder with a range of symptoms that include also mental retardation, as we saw with autism, short stature, facial abnormalities, and cleft palate. Um, then those methylation and acetylation patterns. So 
they are not DNA, they are not um, genetic material. So how are they retained during replication? Um, as you see, um, DNA, methylated DNA is replicated and when new strands develop, they are not methylated. Uh, so DNA methyl transfer is one, recognizes that one methyl group binds to it and um, then adds methyl groups on the new strand. And the interesting thing is that When sperman egg foods, the two nuclei are reprogrammed by the cytoplasm of the egg. Uh, the author of the book really um, uh, asked this question early in the book and then answered that uh, cytoplasm of the egg has those specific factors that allow the nuclei, uh, the inserted nuclei to be reprogrammed. And uh, sperm nucleus in particular very quickly loses most of the molecular memory of what it was and becomes an oval, almost blank canvas. And reprogramming occurs in 36 hours, whereas that experiment in 1950s um, and, and other experiments there took much longer than 36 hours. And um, so as we see there, when we have soma uh, somatic cells, this means like uh, what body cells, not um, egg or sperm, just simple cells, when we have those epigenetic marks. And uh, uh, during meiosis, we have removed all epigenetic marks. And uh, when, we, when eggs and sperm are produced, then the epigenetic marks are again um, established by DNA methyl transferase, this time 3A and 3B, not DNA methyl transferase 1. So um, genomic imprinting uh, was touched in the book too. And uh, the famous classical example is insulin ligro factor gene. Uh, this product is responsible for um, growth. So if you have normal, um, insulin ligro factor gene when the mice is uh, of normal size. But if you have um, not enough of the product of the gene, not enough of this protein, then the mice is going to be um, small. So the interesting thing and important thing is that this gene is only paternal. Um, it's only paternally um, inherited both paternally and maternally, but the expressed allele is only maternal. So if we um, have homologous chromosomes in those mice, um, uh, one mouse has a maternal allele and another has paternal allele of this gene, but maternal allele is going to be repressed, probably methylated, and this one paternal allele is going to be expressed. So here we, ha we have, as I said, maternal not expressed, this expressed and normal mice. But if we inherit from the uh, father um, mutant, EGF2 allele, then we have a smaller mouse, a smaller mouse because um, then none of the alleles are expressed. And when we have fewer insulin nigro factor proteins, and this is not enough for uh, the mice to be um, huge. And in this case, uh, we do not care if this allele is mutated in uh, the mother. Uh, so that this, what I explained is uh, the classical example of genomic imprinting. And what if the imprinting goes wrong? We, um, so silver Russell syndrome is that is, um, uh, the um, similar example of uh, a small mice because it refers to growth retardation before and after birth. Um, and a reverse situation is um, back with Weidemann syndrome when um, the child is overgrown. And so those two imprinting disorders Mm, the, the overgrowth child has too many EGF2 
so we have the allelic expression of that gene. So it means that both paternal and maternal alleles are expressed. And silver Russell syndrome um, turns out to be because both um, uh, chromosomes lack methylation and we have, as I said, too few of that gene. And this is treated by hormone therapy, whereas um, this is uh, only you know, symptom treating, such as hypoglycemia uh, or surgery to reduce the size of the tongue. Um, so again, we see the same gene, EGF2, and this is just explanation of the two syndromes. So um, in paternal chromosome, as, um, as we already talked, we um, activator binding to enhancer um, activates EGF2 gene expression so that um, this gene is expressed. But interesting thing is that um, activators can only activate one promoter. So when age 19 promoter is not activated in um, paternal chromosome, whereas in maternal chromosome, as we said, EGF2 gene is not expressed. But instead, this activator then activates H19 gene. And this gene has a role in negative regulation of body weight. And it is maternally expressed. So these two genes have shared enhancer and the same activator proteins um, activate either one or another gene. So um, females have um, that uh, CCCTC binding factor bound to insulator. Um, and this is because of EGF2 uh, being not expressed in maternal chromosome because that activator cannot physically access that gene. And it is thought um, um, that from maternal chromosome, this gene is not expressed because um, so that the fetus would not grow too huge in the mother and would not damage um, the mother. And then males um, have activators that access that promoter and uh, males have instead um, a methylated H19 promoter so that um, activators um, are very likely to bind only this gene, but not this one. So we could add to that table that um, overgrowth also occurs because there is too a few H19 uh, gene product. And uh, in this syndrome, we have too many H19 uh, product because it is expressed from both paternal and maternal alleles. Uh, now, um, returning to the story mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, uh, so it turned out individuals that conceived um, uh, during the Dutch hunger winter, um, 60 years later had altered DNA methylation at the imprint in GF2 locus. And this is why the rate was affected so many years uh, later. Uh, now a few publications. So uh, first was about cancer, how epigenetic knowledge of epigenetics could be used in cancer therapy. Um, so actually patients now are staged, as you know, in um, stage one, two, three, four, according to tumor size and other uh, criteria. But actually um, tumor cells can show various patterns of histone modification and individual genes are um, mutated so that uh, every patient is heterogeneous. And uh, so we sh should, even though we divide patients into different groups, um, in every group we have quite different patients with different genetic and epigenetic makeup. So, um, tumorogenesis is the consequence of the combined action of multiple epigenetic events. And, um, you know, tumors um, develop because tumor with good genes, tumor suppressor genes are repressed by uh, methylation of CPG islands. 
um, and uh, due to other uh, epigenetic marks. So if we could uh, reverse that methylation of tumor suppressor genes, these suppressor genes would express proteins that would prevent tumors from growing. And that paper um, concluded, made such conclusion that the biggest problem is selectivity. Uh, if we use drugs that uh, change epigenetics of those cancer cells, um, then uh, epigenetics may be changed in normal cells too. And we do not want that. Um, so normal cells have the ability to compensate for those epigenetic changes. Therefore, maybe our therapy would still work. So we should determine the most important epigenetic alterations for different cancers so that we would know uh, what epigenetic mark we want to take out from cancer cell DNA. And uh, it's actually um, uh, uh, clinical trials of uh, these ep uh, epigenetic therapy is already on the way. And um, this therapy is important adjunctive therapy to chemical therapy and radiotherapy. And the combination of epigenetic therapy and immunotherapy has also been investigated in preclinical and clinical trials. And yeah, it's promising strategy and epigenomes in cancer are related to many aspects during cancer initiation. So maybe with those epigenetic drugs, we could even prevent cancer if we know from DNA sequence that the person is susceptible to cancer. Now, the second paper is about autism. Um, and um, uh, so there, there are known epigenetic marks uh, that lead to autism. Um, well, incorrectly, it, it was actually thought in 1998 that vaccination causes um, autism. So, and um, there is actually a story why this was thought. So symptoms of uh, that kind of uh, autism um, first started becoming obvious at around the same age as when infants are typically giving the MMR vaccination. So even after this published paper, about vaccination, um, uh, less uh, fewer children uh, were uh, vaccinated. Um, later, it came out um, not to be due to vaccines. Then pollution is also um, considered to um, change epi uh, epigenetics of our cells, so that um, it also lead to um, autism. And disrupt metabolic pathways are also found um, in uh, autistic children, um, people. For example, folate pathway. Um, um, autistic children um, have a lot of uh, nicotinic acid that is not methylated. So we could add uh, as adenosyl methionine to those cells. And um, this methyl group would be transferred to that, the nicotinic acid and maybe um, autistic um, symptoms would decrease in those children. And actually this molecule um, is sold as the dietary supplement. Um, so in other disorders that um, are caused by lack of methylation of DNA, this uh, dietary supplement could help. Uh, now about post-traumatic stress disorder, um, I, I don't think, okay, so there are two slides about it. Mm, in, the, in the, um, first, in the one video that, um, I made a whole slide, um, of its, um, screenshots, uh, there was a very, very cute picture that explains a lot, actually. So, uh, it's illustration of one relevant study where, um, parents were not attentive enough to their children, and those children um, experienced probably children like small mites uh, experienced a lot of stress. So there was a lot of cortisol in their blood, and uh, that stress um, added epigenetic marks to their DNA, so that they were then um, later in their lives. Um, and this epigenetic mark remained uh, even after they grew up. And um, 
helps that help manage stress very much related. So um, this is probably um, uh, what occurs uh, during, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the description of it there, but I'm not gonna go into detail. Um, so it's, uh, it actually affects a lot of people. And when I thought that um, it's a lot observed um, in war zone veterans, for example, uh, I remembered my uncle um, returned from Afghanistan war and um, he told me stories that it's actually um, that some like sometimes you wake up from um, I know a dream and you feel like you just were in that um, in that uh, war zone. And so I thought, does epigenetics play a role in, in this kind of um, disorder? Um, so it could be compared to diverse postnatal stresses and that cause uh, increased cortisol in uh, people's blood. And then cortisol um, causes DNA methylation alterations in glucocorticoid um, um, no, cortisol binds to those response elements. And then uh, this leads to DNA methylation alterations. Um, for example, in this gene, which is discussed in this paper in details, glucocorticoid receptor was oppressing brain divided neurotrophic factor genes in animals. Uh, this and this gene um, in humans. And um, this DNA methylation alteration um, in childhood um, causes fertile increased um, increased risk for post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's not only that during uh, that time you experience that fearful, for fearful moment, but you have increased risk to experience that later in your life. And it's probably because uh, your brain cells are um, getting those epigenetic marks too. And in humans, how uh, was the study done? So simply those patients um, uh, were, uh, gave their blood or saliva samples and from there you take um, the cells and you uh, just uh, study its DNA or epigenetic marks. An interesting thing that blood cells, red blood cells, um, had those different epigenetic marks because it feels it's not related to uh, to fear or to to brain that you know causes those post traumatic stress disorder, but it feels that um, uh, those mental mental illnesses uh, reveal that epigenetics is changed um, not only in brains of those patients but in peripheral uh, cells too. Then. Um, penultimate paper, uh, uh, I chose about genes and aggressive behavior. Uh, so it was interesting because um, children who were um, accustomed to abuse had inhibited HPA axis and low blood cortisol. You know, cortisol is stress hormone and you would expect these uh, children to have uh, always increased cortisol, but it's reverse actually. And that low, low blood cortisol uh, elicits antisocial behavior and low self-control. And uh, predispose, uh, this predisposes um, the children uh, to impaired stress response. That is quite interesting. So these children can do um, whatever we want and we do not feel stress if we do something wrong. And here uh, was said that um, these epigenetic changes are produced during infancy when the brain development is maximal. So as we see those epigenetic marks are very um, important very, uh, and, and which marks are um, added to the cells very early on. And oxytocin and serotonin also play um, a role uh, besides cortisol. Uh, so here we see about um, Mm, oxytocin OXTR uh, methylation, uh, which is uh, increased in depressed and anxious adults. Mm, and if serotonin 
functions less than normal, then we, he, we have increased um, aggressive behavior risk in um, uh, people. And um, so adolescents that have been raised in low socioeconomic status show higher methylation of serotonin transporter gene in peripheral lymphocytes and higher amygdala activation in response to fearful faces. And then ethical um, implications is that if I was raised in soci uh, low socioeconomic uh, status, and I know that I have that higher methylation of serotonin transporter gene, maybe I can, um, you know, reverse that methylation, and then my um, epigenetics will be the same as epigenetics of um, another person who was raised in a high um, socio-academic uh, economic status. So these ethical implications um, impede um, epigenetics application uh, for treatment of cancer, for example. And um, so epigenetic effects, as we talked, have been associated with pollution, toxic chemicals, pesticides, poverty, discrimination, land use, the sub -sub standard living and working conditions. Yeah, so um, so these were the questions that um, offer us, and I'm not, not going to explain, but for example, there was the question, why does Arabidopsis only flowers after exposure for a long period of cold? So this is explained if you want, you can um, check uh, the recording and because it's very clear explanation. And also Afra uh, um, answered why um, or all um, tortoiseshell cats are females, not males. And here is the um, hint for you. Yeah, so here is um, the, um, yeah, so I decided that I will do maximum 20 slides in uh, every next session because you are not stopping me, but uh, then I have to stop myself because it just, I, I cannot stop when I start preparing presentation. So thank you for your attention. And if you have some questions, you can ask them right now. Thank you so much. Uh, basically, uh, it's not a question, it's just an addition to the epigenetics of mental health. Uh, there, there was a really cool study. I think it was published like a year ago or two years ago. And my friend Sophia actually pointed out to me. But um, basically, the first evidence, like medical evidence, that psychotherapy actually works for treatment of mental illness came from this study, which showed that um, I think it was brain derived neurotrophic factor or gene. Mm -hmm. Basically, like people who went to therapy, they have reduced methylation of BDNF factor. Mm -hmm. So, and it, BDNF is as associated with neuroplasticity and with uh, improvement in mental health disorders. So, it was like the first direct evidence that psychotherapy can actually alter brain chemistry, which was not shown before. Yeah. So is this used nowadays to treat patients? Uh, no, is... It was some um, ZPF something something gene. I oh. think it's responsible for calcium signaling. Oh, okay. Uh, I found this review. Oh, uh, okay. I well, that's nice. Not this one. No, it's cortisol. Oh, so there is another study. Oh, that. yeah. Well, uh, can you please send it over to me? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, it's by Perot at all. I'm going to just stop it. Well, I guess if there's many studies, then there are definitely medical implications, even though they're like uh, yeah. uh, in, you know, in, in the workings. Oh, yeah. It, it's So I just found this study and it's just for borderline personality disorder, but Okay, I sent it in the chat. But yeah, still so cool. Wait, I'm checking. Cause, but is it gonna be used like clinically? Because uh, in cancer lectures, I asked my uh, professor, you know, we, we were studying drugs only. I said, so if we, can we uh, maybe remove some epigenetic marks from cancer cells to treat them? And when he, he said, um, you know, it's all about ethical implications, 
we cannot use epigenetics to treat patients due to those ethical considerations. So like what, what I understood is that even you have evidence that you know your brain can get healthier, you will not be allowed to... But like it's, it's psychotherapy. So like everyone, or oh, a, a lot of people has been using psychotherapy for quite some time, but b- because there is such a huge gap between psychology and like psychotherapy and psychiatry, because psychiatrists can be like, uh, a bit dismissing of psychology or psychotherapy as a method like not not so much anymore but uh it just helps to bridge the gap between these two disciplines yeah so you were talking about that protein right uh, like a drug who would that would change the uh, brain structure no but yeah it, it's naturally secreted in the brain and like oh, it's naturally secreted yeah. Yeah. And basically, you know, because of the trauma, it gets mesylated. So it's mm. so your brain, your uh, neural connections get fixed, and you, you can't really relearn your behavioral patterns. But when you go to therapy, it somehow uh, removes, like one of the uh, correlations that they found that it removes mesylation of this gene. So there is more plasticity in the brain. So person, you know, changes their behavioral behavior and thinking patterns and uh, gets rid of cognitive distortions. Wow, that's great. Yeah, mm-hmm. I will read that paper. Very interesting. Thank you. So the last long session, wow, one hour. It's too much for sure. Okay, we will make it shorter. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. Anyway, it was really interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. So have a nice week. End of term. Yeah, have a nice week, everyone. And uh, happy you. Women's Day. Yeah, to you too. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.